typology. And I'll explain it and then I'll show you some photographs. There's three broad types of rooming house. Now, when I say that, I've already said it's enormously diverse. Okay, so I'm, I'm simplifying for the purposes of us to have a framework to think about this. There's traditional rooming houses. These are the big old ones in this inner city. Some of them were purpose-built as rooming houses. Quite a lot of them are big old houses or mansions that have been converted into rooming houses. Then there are what I'm going to call suburban rooming, house, rooming houses. These are, the, these are the new rooming houses. These are the ones that are in conventional suburban houses, typically with somewhere between five and nine bedrooms. And then your third category is community rooming houses, which are, are not-for-profit rooming houses, and they too vary quite a lot. Um, and some of these are in, you know, in pretty good condition, but, but they also vary from those in pretty good condition to those that are a little more marginal. Now, if we look at the inner, inner city, I've divided the rooming houses into those that have 20 or more bedrooms. That's really the traditional ones. Medium-sized 10 to 19 bedrooms and 4 to 9. Even in the inner city, only one in five of the rooming houses was actually large, although there was a lot that were 10 to 19. In the inner city, you've still got 44% of them have got 4 to 9. But don't forget these big ones that have got 40 or 50 people. You know, that, they've got the great bulk of the, pop, of the population. Um, but where are these ones? Well, here in the city of Yarra, a lot of them are small. And also in the, it's the city of Stonington, particularly the grand part of the city of Stonington. Now, if you come to the suburbs, you'll really see the picture. Once you get to the suburbs, in the inner suburbs, 80% of those 1,049 boarding houses had four to nine bedrooms. They were small. You know, the five percent had twenty plus bedrooms, and I went and looked at some of the, you know, some of the big ones out in the suburbs, and they're often in, you know, all kinds of converted dwellings. Something that was, um, you know, something that was formerly age care, age care accommodation has now become a boarding house. Um, occasionally, a factory that's become a boarding house. I did come across just one fire station that's become a boarding house, um, although that was actually in the inner suburbs. Um, if you look at the outer suburbs, in other words, you know, out, out on the suburban fringe, nearly everything is small. And overall, this is just looking at the inner and outer suburbs, 82% were small. Now, if you look at the 1,269 registered ones, three quarters of them were actually <coughs> small, of the actual registered ones, officially registered. So, one of the major changes is boarding houses these days are typically quite small dwellings. And they typically like, you know, the so-called suburban house. Now, I'll just show you a few pictures so you can get a sense of what this is all about. This is one of the large, older-style boarding houses in the inner city. I've taken the picture from the side, although some of you may recognise it, um, because it's named at the front. So I've just taken it down here. This, as far as I understand, was actually purpose-built. It's a large boarding house that will take about 60, 60 people. This is another large one in the inner city, but this is actually a converted dwelling. It, it was, originally it was a nurse's home, but these days it's a rooming house. Um, and I've actually, I went, I've, I've actually been all through this one. It's in terrible condition in some way. Like I went through with the council inspectors. Um, and it's, I mean, it probably hasn't been painted for 20 or 30 years. And one of the things that I noticed was, and this has been very middle class on my top, but the line on the floor in the public areas was so warm that it had no pattern left. Um, and you know, in the communal bathrooms there were taps missing, there were holes in the wall, the fire escape was blocked and, and so forth. This is another inner city one. This is a converted, this is two old Victorian houses, probably once upon a time very grand Victorian houses. And you find quite a lot of rooming houses like this in the inner city. I mean, not exactly like that, but big old houses of what, some description. You can probably see, just about see up there, there are actually rooms in the roof. Um, the balconies have been converted into rooms, <coughs> and it's on a hill, so there's actually basement rooms. You can just see the, the beginnings of it. And there's been some repairs to the front door where maybe someone's kicked the door in, or, or whatever. That accommodated officially 24 four people. This is a rooming house very close to my own university, RMIT. Um, it's a converted factory. 
and it had the slogan being diplomatic up one without the um, WW address and the telephone number, but it's relatively close to the university. Um, and it, a room is about $210 a week, and it seems, as far as I can see, when I talk to a few people, mainly Melbourne University and RMIT University students in it. Um, there aren't a lot of converted factories, but it's quite visibly this is a converted, this is a converted factory, it's now ruining us. Um, I didn't discover this one until after the census, but, and I don't know when it started, but it wasn't a registered rooming house. Um, and then we're out in the suburbs. This is what they look like. This is out in the eastern suburbs. It's actually quite close to Monash University. Um, there are hundreds of the rooming houses look like this. They look no different from other houses of, you know, houses in the same street. This is the western side of the city. This is a rooming house. Um, you know, you wouldn't know where it was, it just looks like many other weatherboard houses and lots of rooming houses look just like that. Uh, this, this one is a converted shop, also on the western side of the city. It was actually quite a large rooming house because you can probably just see up here, there was actually a conventional house behind it. So it's a shop front with a house and I think, uh, if I remember rightly, it, was, it accommodated 10 or, 10 or 12 people. This is a rooming house out outer east. Um, this is one of the ones that's probably going to be demolished. It looks in pretty bad shape. Um, and it's just out, out in the outer east and outer eastern suburbs. And I think... Oh, yeah, OK. So that, that gives you a, a kind of a sense of what they're like. Now, I want to make three points of conclusion. Um, I do have a bit to say about each of the points. The first point of conclusion is really, well, how much change has there been? This is very, very difficult to know, because if we take the official ABS figure of 2946 and the new figure, then the increase is roughly about four times. If we take the counting the homeless figure and the new figure, the increase is about three times. But you've got to bear in mind that the ABS may not have counted all the ruling houses in 2006, because the census collectors, or it, 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 it's quite complicated how they do it, but the census collectors have to identify these dwellings. And if they were anything off, like me when they, st when they started, they just simply wouldn't. Oh, this is a suburban house, we'll leave the suburban, you know, we'll leave a conventional household form. If it's a boarding house, you've got to leave individual forms. Mm -hmm. right? So it's likely that some of them were undercounted in 2006. So you've got a very tricky issue of has there been an enormous increase, which is what the feet the figures look like on face value, and the two figures that we've got from the ABS and counting the homeless are, in quotes, the best that we have, or are both of them actually an undercount because the number of boarding houses was undercounted in 2006. I think it's likely some were undercounted, but I honestly don't know how many. Um, but when you talk to the councils, they all think there's been a big increase in the last few years. Um, second question is who's, who's in them? This looks very complicated. Um, I've used some information from the Tenants Union. This is from Melbourne in September quarter 2011, in other words, when the census occurred. And this is various household types, and this is their income source, their accommodation, the median rent for that accommodation, their income, and their disposable income. If you take a couple with two children living in Melbourne on average weekly earnings, back in um, September 2011, their income according to the ABS tax was $1,309 a week. And the, this assumes that they needed a three bedroom house if they had two kids. And the median house, median rent for a three bedroom house was $340. Therefore, they had a disposable income of $969. Do you follow? follow? Yep. Okay, well done. A single person on Newstart, it's assumed he or she was sharing a two bedroom flat. The single person on Newstart would have had an income of 303 at that time. The median rent for a two-bedroom flat share would be 175. In other words, it was 350 for the flat, 175 each. They would have had a disposable income of 128. The single parent with a child renting a two-bedroom flat would have had a disposable income of 175. That would have been their income. That would be the median rent for a two-bedroom flat. An aged person in a one-bedroom flat they would have had a disposable income of 134, and a young person on our study sharing with another young person would have had a disposable income 
of 79, the people in the boarding houses are basically poor people who are tipping over from, you know, from people on the margins. Now, lots of people on the margins manage to get by in some way. So, for example, a single, a single parent with a child, you know, she, she or possibly he, but she may have decided to rent the two-bedroom flat but rented out one of the rooms to someone else to keep the rent down. People use all kinds of things. I know I've noticed in my local area, people delivering you know, all the, the packets of things through the door, they're nearly always pensioners, and they're probably just earning a little bit of money to, to subsidise their income. People do all kinds of things to manage. But some people from these groups, they tip over into the homeless population because they can't simply manage to get by, particularly if there's only one income. Because rents are now so expensive, it's really difficult. If it, It's easiest to rent if you're a couple. If you're single, it's tough. And if you're on a welfare benefit, it's very tough. Um, so who are the people who are coming in? And the welfare agencies tell you these sorts of things. They now, welfare agencies tell you, well, we get some elderly people in the boarding houses. What's typically happened is it was an elderly couple, they rented a flat, they lived there for a long time, then one of them died, and their pension was cut in half, and they could no longer afford the flat, and they've ended up in a rooming house. You go to welfare agencies, and they say to you, we try if at all possible not to put families in boarding houses. But it's expensive to put them in motels. So in one area they told me it would cost $900 a week to put people in a, motel, a family in a motel. In another area, 700 in another area, 1,000. It varies. What they say is we try not to put families in motels, I mean boarding houses, we put them in motels. But sometimes we don't have the money. So we have to put families in boarding houses because there isn't any choice. Um, now, what's happening across the country? I've done exactly the same calculation of disposable income for each of the capital cities for the single person on Newstart, for the single parent with a child, for the single person on an age pension, for the single person on our study. So the calculations that I showed you from Melbourne, I've done it in exactly the same way to give you their disposable income for in each of these areas. Now, when you look at this, it looks like a blur, but because there's far too many numbers. <laughs> and you can look carefully, you know, at, at your own speed later on. But let's look at Melbourne first of all. That's a disposable income for the four groups, okay? Get sense? Now, have a look, have a look at Perth. It's pretty similar. Not absolutely identical, but the Melbourne and Perth figures are rather similar, okay? Now look at Brisbane. Brisbane Melbourne and Perth look about the same. The housing pressures that we see in Melbourne are probably fairly similar in Perth and Brisbane. It looks a bit better in Adelaide and Hobart. If you compare Adelaide with Melbourne, or Adelaide with Brisbane if you got it that easier, you can see people have more disposable income in Adelaide. Or if you compare Hobart with Melbourne, you can see they have more disposable income in Hobart. So the first pattern is Brisbane, Perth and Melbourne are pretty similar. Things look a bit better in Adelaide and Hobart because housing costs are not so high. Now have a look at Canberra and Darwin. Maybe we compare them with Brisbane because they're next to each other. It looks worse. It's more difficult in Canberra and Darwin. It's actually, I forget now, but it's something like $500 a week to rent a three-bedroom suburban housing in Darwin with an incredibly short supply. It looks more difficult in Darwin and Canberra. And now look at Sydney compared with Melbourne. It looks massively worse than Sydney. Now, what this means, I think, is the patterns that we see in Melbourne have to be happening across the country. I reckon it's almost certainly going to be worse in Sydney. I reckon probably the patterns we see in Melbourne will be fairly similar in Perth and Brisbane but a bit worse in Canberra and Darwin, and a lot worse in Sydney, and probably a bit better in Adelaide and Hobart. Because the structural things that are causing the pressure look, in broad terms, reasonably similar. Now, what does this mean in terms of the overall number across the country? Counting the homeless estimates 
that 17.3% of the boarding house population in, sorry, and probably a bit better in Adelaide and Hobart. Right? Because the structural things that are causing the pressure look, in broad terms, reasonably similar. Now, what does this mean in terms of the overall number across the country? Counting the homeless estimates that 17.3% of the boarding house population in, sorry, 17% of the boarding census night. So counting the army says of, of the whole boarding house population across the country, what percentage were in Melbourne? It was 17.3. The ABS report says that the percentage of the boarding house population in Melbourne was 17.5. Right? There's no difference. They both calculate the proportion of people in boarding houses. The percentage in Melbourne was about the same. And I can't really see any reason to think Melbourne has gone up dramatically or gone down dramatically. Therefore, if we counted 12, 5, 6, 8 in Melbourne this time, and it was 17.5%, 100 over 17.5, the figure across the country is about 72. And if we use 17.3, it's slightly above 72. It's an estimate. It has to be an estimate. But if things are happening in the way that I think, which is the broad patterns that we see in Melbourne are happening everywhere and worse in Sydney, then the overall boarding house population it's probably around about 70,000, give or take, you know, a few thousand, maybe it's 60, maybe it's 75. But you can see we're not looking at, at whatever it was, 17,000 or 16,800. The numbers are going up and they're going up dramatically. And it's a consequence of the housing crisis. Now, and this is what really irritates me, the ABS are going to publish new figures. And they're going to come out with a much lower figure. And the reason is the census collectors couldn't see the boarding houses. They went into the wrong category. And the ABS will publish the official data and say, we are right. And I think they are wrong. It's not what is happening on the ground. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit irritated. But sometimes the people at the ABS have never been in a homeless service in their life. They sit in Canberra in the boardroom and they work out the decisions. And if they went around a bit more and talked to a few more people, they would have a more realistic understanding of what's going on. Now I really hope. And it's on film! Oh. <laughs> I didn't say that! Um, there you go. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, questions and comments?